you are listening to By the Book, because if you don't look at the world through the Bible, you will never see it right. This is Alan Griffith, your host for episode 34 of By the Book. Last time we were talking about the training of children, and I'm going to get back to that. I was just so burdened for it, I wanted to get one session in on that. I'm going to get back to that in the context of us talking about the family and marriage. And I want to get into that this morning, uh, reminding you that the family today is under tremendous attack. The, the socialist movement and the Marxist movement uh, that is gaining strength in our country hates family. Uh, they hate the nuclear family, the idea of a husband and wife and children living together. They would rather have a, a communal situation where the children are out from under their parents and the, the children are, are under the, the Hillary Clinton village concept and so on. And they especially hate the patriarchal family, the God-designed family. They hate the family where the man is the head of the wife and the head of his home. But that is the design of God and you and I need to get back to it. You and I cannot necessarily affect everything that's going on around us. I wish we could, but we cannot necessarily change what is going on in government right now. We are having a terrible time with the educational system. Uh, The whole entertainment system is an absolute disgrace. In the midst of all of that exists your family. Now, I don't know your situation. You may be single having never been married. You may be married. You might have a good marriage. You might wish you weren't married. Uh, I don't know where you are. But I'm going to challenge us that from wherever we are, we seek to bring our family experience into harmony as much as possible. Bring it into harmony with what God says about marriage and family. So again, I don't know where you are uh, in a sense. I don't mean in a callous way, but I, I don't care where you are because we're not trying to go after you or put anybody down. We're simply saying there is an ideal. The ideal is the family that God designed. And wherever we are, we ought to look at that and say, how do I get there? Or at least how do I get close to that? There might be some things that are broken that cannot be repaired, but how do I move toward what God laid out in his word for a life, for a husband, for a wife, for a marriage, for a family? That's what we want to talk about. And so to do that, we're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 2. Now, we could go back to Genesis 1 and even an earlier section in chapter 2, but I always like to start in Genesis 2 and verse 18 when I talk about these things. By the time we get to Genesis 2, 18, God has created Adam, and he has put Adam in the Garden of Eden. God has instructed Adam about some of his responsibilities, and God has told Adam of the forbidden food, don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Adam already has that information and that responsibility. Then in Genesis 2.18, there is an observation that is made uh, by God. Now Moses wrote uh, the first five books of the Bible, so Moses is the writer. He records for us Uh, what happens. He records the narrative. He records, in this case, something that God himself said. So in verse 18 of Genesis 2, we read this, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. God is setting the stage for marriage and family. He has created the man, and his observation is it isn't good that the man should be alone. 
God then says he's going to do something about that. He says this, I will make him and help meet for him. Now, in the Hebrew, that term help meet is just a single term. It's helper. But the idea of the term is a helper who is fit or suitable or just right. So immediately we recognize this. The man has a responsibility before God to serve God, to live for God. Every man better get hold of that, by the way. That's your obligation, sir. And then he says, and I'm going to make for this man a helper, a helper who is just right for him, the perfect fit, the perfect match. And as we're going to see in a moment, he goes on and creates the woman. Well, right at the beginning of time, then, there, there is an order that is established. The man created to serve God, the woman created to be the helper. Now, that's the way marriage is supposed to work. That's the way family is supposed to work. And there are failures on the parts of all of us. There are men who will not take their responsibility. We're going to discuss it. There are ladies who don't like their role. We're going to discuss it. But this is how it all begins. So right at the very beginning of time, God lays out the plan. Now, verses 19 and 20 uh, give us uh, some, some filler, if I dare put it that way. When it says, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But, and I'm so grateful for this, but for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. Of all the animal kingdom, Adam is given the responsibility of, of naming them and identifying them. But then the statement is made, but about all the animal kingdom, there was nothing suitable to be the helper for Adam. There was nothing that would fit. There was nothing that would match. There was nothing that would be right. And I want to emphasize for a moment here the clear distinction in the scriptures between mankind and the animal kingdom. Man, as the Bible tells us elsewhere, back in chapter 1 and elsewhere, man was made in the image and likeness of God. The animal was not made in the image and likeness of God. I heard some commentary the other day where there's discussion about whether personhood can be assigned to an animal. Now, that's evidently being discussed in some circles today. It's absolutely ridiculous. It is a disgrace. It is the undermining of humanity. It is rebellion against God. But uh, no surprise, uh, the discussion is evidently being carried out. But no, mankind is different from the animal, and the animal is different from humanity. So God says, nothing here will do the job. No animal will be suitable to be with a man. And by the way, one of the most vile and wicked sins ever talked about is bestiality, where you have humans and animals uh, being intimate in a sense. Now, what a disgrace, but it happens, unfortunately. And I, I believe our society is moving more and more in that direction. Believe me, as we plunge into deeper and deeper sin, we're heading in that direction. Not of God. What did God do? Verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he, God, took one of his, Adam's, ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now, the term that is translated rib here is often translated side in the Bible. And I think it's appropriate to think that God did not simply take a, a bone 
and uh, create the woman out of the bone. He took the side of Adam. We don't know how much of it, but more than just a bone. And he takes this and he fashions the woman. He fashions her out of the man. He is going to have the one man be used to bring forth two, he and his wife, which is interesting because of what marriage is. But in any event, that's what the Lord does. And then verse 23, as the Lord brings the woman to the man in verse 22, verse 23 says, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24. Verse 24 is the commentary of God. It's setting the stage for future marriage. Verse 24. God says, and we know it's God who says it because the Lord Jesus quotes him later in uh, the Gospels. Here's what he said. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, that's marriage as God designed it going forward after creating Adam and Eve. In other words, that is marriage for us. This is what's supposed to happen. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother. Now, that doesn't mean that men don't love their parents anymore. It doesn't mean that they don't respect them anymore. It does mean this, the married man has no obligation to obey his parents. I know some young couples get married and the the husband's parents are controlling. That's wrong. By the way, I want to tell you this, one of the most difficult things for a man to ever have to do is to take graciously but firmly a stand against his own parents in order to care for and protect his new wife. Now, that's a tough one. I've seen men who have refused to do it. I've seen men who have done it and done it the wrong way. But I want you to know this, it has to be done. The man, when he gets married, begins a new family. And again, he honors his parents. He might very well receive counsel from his parents, which is fine, but his loyalty now is to his wife. Sir, do you understand that? Your loyalty is to your wife. You take care of your wife. You protect your wife. You minister to your wife. You take care of her needs, respect your parents, but they must not be controllers. And I'm going to say this to you who are married and have married children. Be careful. Be careful how you treat them. Don't try to be the controller. Don't use finances to control. Uh, Don't control with, you know, we're not going to be nice to you. We're not going to Uh, put you in the will. We're not going to whatever it might be if you don't do what we say. Listen, don't be that kind of in-law. Don't be that kind of parent. And I wish that kind of thing didn't happen, but it does. So the man leaves his father and mother. He cleaves to his wife. The term cleave there involves the idea of pursuing. The man ought to be the pursuer. Sometimes ladies are. Pursuing the woman overtaking her, winning her, wooing her. And then once a man has her as his wife, he is then loyal to her for the rest of his life. That's marriage. A man leaves his father and mother. He cleaves to his wife. And then this is interesting because, again, in the creation of Adam and Eve, God took one and made them two. In marriage, God takes two and he makes them one. It says, verse 24 at the end, they shall be one flesh. 
Now, I've had the privilege of conducting a lot of weddings, and uh, most of them good experiences, sometimes uh, questionable, I guess, whether or not this couple should get married. I, I've always fallen back pretty much on parental uh, permission and blessing. But marriage is for life, and marriage is not something the preacher does. Marriage is something that God does. It is God who takes these two people, and it is God who makes them one flesh. And every single person needs to remember that. The Lord Jesus would say in the New Testament, and we're not going to go too far into that right now, but he said, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. When you get married, you make a commitment for the rest of your life. It might be that you make these vows for as long as you both shall live, or it might be till death do us part. But the entire plan of God is one marriage for life, and then a second marriage only if one partner has passed away. That's what God wants. One man, one woman for life. Now, again, I don't know where you are. And I'm not trying to, you know, put you down if you're in a difficult situation. I'm simply trying to raise God's standard before our eyes. This is what it is supposed to be, and we need to get back to it. And you might be a situation where you are divorced and whatever it might be, but this, what we're talking about, this is for your children. This is for your grandchildren. This, again, is to raise the standard that God has set to get marriage back to be what it ought to be, to get families back to be what they ought to be. You can't change the past. You pick up from where you are, but many people need to do that and say, okay, from this point forward, I am aiming for what I know God wants. Now, here's the tragedy of history. I don't know how long it was that Adam and Eve were married until the devil came on the scene. But in chapter 3, he does come on the scene. It says in verse 1 that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he came and he went after the woman. I don't know where Adam was. I don't know what instruction he had given her to uh, uh, follow through on what God had given him. But the devil went after the woman, and uh, the Bible has other things to say about that. That's, that's part of the reason why the woman is not supposed to be the leader in the home. And by the way, if you're a lady listening and you're the leader in your home, you're not a very happy person. And if you're a man listening and your wife is the leader of the home, you are an extremely unhappy person. The devil went after the woman, and here's what he said. He said to her, Yea, hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did God tell you you're not allowed to eat of everything that's in the garden? Now, listen to the woman's response, and we're not going to get too far into this before we have to close. But it says, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Well, you know, as far as we know, God didn't tell Adam he wasn't supposed to touch the fruit. Probably wise if he didn't. But that's the response of, of Eve. Oh, God said we can't eat it. We're not even allowed to touch it or we'll die. Well, the devil does what he always does. He calls God a liar. Verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. God lied to you. Now, I'm going to bring this to a close with this thought in mind. If Eve, whether she understood it or not, 
if Eve had simply done what God told her to do. If Eve would have simply believed God, trusted God's character, she'd have never followed through and taken of the fruit that led eventually to her and Adam's death, physically and spiritually. So I'm going to say this. When it comes to marriage, when it comes to life, we may not understand everything that we read, but if you and I will say, when I find out what God says, I'm going to believe it, I'm going to do it. If Adam and Eve had done that, it would have saved a whole lot of trouble for them and for us. More next time. Lord bless you.